Good evening and welcome to the Australian Stock Market Show. Tonight's show is all about how to grab a bargain stock the right way. We'll also share whether buying the cheapest stocks is wise or is this just another market myth? And of course, we'll share our latest list of exciting stocks trading below $10. Answer your questions about your favourite stocks and so make you better, more informed, um, so you'll make better, more informed decisions. Hello, I'm Janine Cox, your host for tonight, and joining me is Dale Gillam, and we're Australia's most trusted stock market educators. You told me I was going to do that, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> you just were thinking of that in your head. Yep. Hey, guess what? I went to the Moomba thing on Sunday. You did? On the river, yeah. I was watching the water skiing. Okay, you didn't get a balloon? No, I didn't get a balloon animal, even though they were free for the kids, but I'm not that young. You couldn't pass this one I this couldn't year. pass it. No, but I went to the water skiing and I was watching the slalom where they have, they have the, obviously they're skiing behind a boat and they progressively make the rope shorter mm. and they're going around these things and I'm thinking, geez, that's the journey of a trader, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Zoom, zoom, yeah, yeah, zoom. we've got a good picture on that one. And it was like, you know, the stuff going everywhere and then all of a sudden the rope, rope gets too short and pff, there you go, they're gone, they're in the water. <laughs> Splash, <yeah. laughs> but that's a bit of, it was, as I was watching, I'm thinking, that's like a bit of a metaphor for trading, isn't it? Because a lot of people, Probably. it's it, a lot of people do that in their journey. Like mm. you were talking about it last week, how people don't go from a low point to a high point. You know, like a linear line, they go mm. all over the place. Yes. And I was like, yep, that's the slalom. Mm, okay. Very good. But it was fun watching it, fun being at Mooma. But we do need to move on and get into our show for the night, don't we? We do. And now I have a quote for you all tonight, and it comes from Benjamin Franklin, who said, "Necessity never made a good bargain." Now, this is really about when the person with whom you trade knows that you're desperate, you're not going to get a good deal. Mm. Well, that's true, isn't it? So it's never, ever, ever try and go into a bargain when you are desperate. It's like going into a house, you know, looking to buy a house, mm -hmm. and you go into that negotiation being you have to have that house. That's the wrong the negotiation, and I'll sort to negotiate for a deal is to always be prepared to walk away from every deal mm. if you're not going to get what, what you need and what's going to satisfy you. But it's also creating a win-win on both sides. Make the other party feel like they're winning too. Yep. So I love that quote. I, I think, think that's, that's really, really, really good. a really good way to sum it up. Well, it's, it's in the stock market, it's about getting a fair price for the fair stock, isn't it? Mm, true. Yeah, not, uh, not a bad price for a bad stock. Well, I guess in the stock market... Mm. If, if you're desperate, you're going to be trading in a way that's not really congruent with you. Well, they are. And that's where we get that FOMO. You know, people mm. you know, trading on FOMO because they think, oh, I've got to get in the market. I've got to do this. And I mean, obviously, you know, yesterday the market went down fairly mm. heavily. Today it went down a bit more. And this was, to me, that was exciting. What, what the I'm earliest saying. part of the week. We want the market to yeah. go down on a Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, don't we? so I'm excited for the rest of the week. Mm. But I'm sure a lot of people may have been going, oh, my God, and started mm. selling their stocks and doing all the things. Yep. That's the slalom rider yeah. going all over the place. But <laughs> exactly. I'm excited about tonight anyway. But before we do get into tonight's show, if you do have a question that you're just dying to ask us, then all you need to do is simply text Janine and I on 0423 959 846. That's 0423 959 846. So make sure you pick up your mobile phone now and get texting your questions. While we wait for your text, it is the second Tuesday in the month and this means that we normally take a look at the sectors in the Australian market. So let's get into the charts. Okay, now on your screen is the sectors in the Australian market and look at the sea of red. It looks almost, if it was brown, it'd be looking like the Yarra River here in Melbourne. It's only the week. It's only the week. Well, it's only two days. The week that you commented on. Sorry, it's the only <laughs> week that I commented on. It is the week. Now have a look. That's the month. <laughs> is that the month or the year? The year. Well, I know. That's what I was saying. It was only two days there. Mm. So now it's green and... So it's a bit different. That's what I wanted to just show you how it works. Well, it is. Now we're seeing energy, which is actually um, the biggest negative on the board right now. Yep. Bit of a, a, a flip, isn't it, from what happened last year? Well, last year energy was good. Um, obviously, financials weren't as good last year. Materials weren't as good last year, but financials down 4.52% for the year. Yeah. Um, not necessarily worrying, but a little bit, um, probably a little bit of nervousness about what's been going on in the US, obviously, with that, um, was it called Silicon Valley Bank that went yes. down the other day in the, mm -hmm. in the US? And I've sort of always posts about it. I went, yeah, okay, well, that's the US. But the US government had come in and 
said everybody's going to get their money. That's so right. So there's some sort of deposits guaranteed type scheme yeah, there. We're not in that part of the cycle where they no, let them fail. No, they're not. We're not. I'm thinking we're a long way. If you go and look at the market, we're a long way from mm. anywhere where a crash is going to happen. And mm. so I think a bit of an overreaction at the moment. I agree with you. Just opportunity. It, yes. it just creates more opportunity, doesn't it? I can sniff a good deal coming. <laughs> a good bargain? There's a good bargain coming. <laughs> it's like going okay. past Bunnings and going, there's a yep. nice sausage there. Okay, that's okay. fantastic. Oh, All right, important utilities. for us guys. Really? Okay. Yes, let's get back it's to part the, of the Bunnings trip. Absolutely. All right, uh, utilities, yep. you can see there, is down 2.1%. Yep. So that we've had seen AGL and the like um, get affected by... And they're actually recovering, aren't they? So yep. we've seen a bit of a recovery there. But nice healthcare, yep. down 0.44%. That was the big negative mm. uh, last year. So one of the big ones. So a bit of a comeback there in healthcare, almost neutral. Materials, 0.49%. Um, so almost line ball, but we may see some more development happen later in the year on in that sector. Consumer staples up 2.76%. Uh, communication services up 3.3%. Information technology almost 4% there, which is really good to see. Have you got any comments about that one? Yeah, I think, I mean, it did take off like a bit of a rocket um, mm. a little bit earlier this year, and I think it took off too fast. So I would be surprised to see this slow down a little You'd bit. You'd be happy for that. Um, All right. And industrials up 4.6%, which sign. is great to see. We talked about that last week. And, yeah. and there are more uh, stocks that we're going to be talking about in this space um, I don't know if it'll be next week, but we'll see how we go. We've got Depends a really on how good many topic. people hound you to say, look, can we have a look at more of these stocks? <laughs> yeah, some really good Consumer ones. Consumer discretionary, Consumer that's a big surprise. Consumer discretionary, 7.2%. Yeah, and I mean, that sort of flies in the face of what we've been seeing with all the interest rate rises, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Very, so, very much so. So we're really going to look nice. at the charts or any charts? Uh, well, look, I think what we should do is have a look while we're on that um, topic, look at consumer discretionary and see mm -hmm. what's going on there on the chart. Now, I was on a forum um, with our traders, so every month I meet with our traders who have done the advanced, our advanced course, and as you know, and we were just discussing some of the mm -hmm. stocks, and now there were some that looked like this, of yep. course, so obviously the stocks within the sector take on the shape of the sector depending on their weighting. Now, when you see these sorts of consolidations going on, Often this can be the build up prior to a big rise, but it can also be a, a distribution. A distribution before a big before fall. Before a fall, right? So this is what we've got to watch at the moment. I mean, the beautiful thing here is we're seeing these lows getting higher mm -hmm. and we have just made a, a, a higher point relative to the low that happened in 2022. So for about the last, what, year, year roughly, um, we're, we're actually ahead back in February in this sector. So that was really good to see. But we just now need to see it settle down a bit. And I think it's still got the potential to do that. A push above 3,100 points will sort of seal the deal and give us a confirmation that it's going back up yeah, again. Yeah, so you're saying this short-term bearishness that we've seen this month here and this bar here, mm. you're saying that's just going to be short-term? Yeah, well, it's only at the moment um, six weeks down. So, mm. you know, it doesn't mean that... It's typical, if you have a look at what has mm. gone on previously, we've had three, four, five, six, six weeks down in here. So similar sort of timing. Here we had um, almost the same as well. So it's typical, really. Well, this thing What's... hasn't moved anywhere near as far down as the other two big moves. There's only a minor move down on this sector at the moment. And that's a positive as well. Mm. 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 Anything else you want to say? Look, we could have one more week down. That's quite um possible yeah. but as soon as we start to see a rise above this week's high then we know where it's going well I, look i think the market is super exciting and it wouldn't surprise me if we spent the rest of the week going up but mm. i'll keep that to myself for a few minutes there's a tip from dale and that is it for our thoughts on the sectors in the australian market now for those watching us on youtube just remember that you will only see a part of this live stream however you can participate in the show by emailing in your questions which we will answer in the next week's show. So if you want to see the full live show, you will need to head over to TalkingWealth.com and subscribe with subscriptions at just $3.54 per week. You'll gain a wealth of knowledge as you watch hundreds of interviews with some of the best experts in money, business mindset and many other areas. Now, let's get into the first email question. Now we've got an email from Guy who says, Hi Dale, when I sell my shares and make a profit, 
Am I right that there is a 50% tax if the shares are less than 12 months old? Um, also, if I'm paying income tax through work, do I have to pay more tax if the shares increase my overall income? Um, if it puts me in the next tax bracket, do I need to put more tax aside to compensate? Thank you, Guy. Very good question, isn't it? It's a very well thought out He's got question. the first one a bit backwards, but the second one, is he's fairly much mm. on the money. Now, the 50% um, is not a 50% tax guy it's if you hold a share for more than 12 months uh, and then sell it then you get a 50 percent discount on the capital gain so for example if you bought a share for a thousand dollars and in 12 months time you um, reaped uh, sorry 18 months time you reap fifteen hundred dollars in theory you've made a five hundred dollar capital gain on that what the tax department does is say well let's halve that now you've made a capital gain of two hundred and fifty dollars it's two, well, two and a half, it's uh, nice, two hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, and so then that would go it. into your taxable income, which was the second part of your question. Mm. So yes, it could put you up into the next tax bracket if you have lots of capital gains. But and it, so, but, but it mm. needs to be looked at in terms of what does that mean when you go yeah. into another tax bracket. So you're not all mm. of a sudden paying that high percentage across the whole lot. It's a tiered structure. So Correct. the best thing that anybody can do if you've got tax questions is to go to the ATO website and find out directly because we're not tax experts. Um, that's Speak not for our yourself. And neither is he. <laughs> so the best place to go is straight to the horse's mouth and, and get to that ATO website. That's really fantastic, the mm. um, information that they, they provide these days, isn't it? Well, it is. If you're getting capital gains, then there's also the other side of the story is it's income versus expenditure. That's what it is. So whatever's, you know, in, in terms of you might be able to claim some things on your tax that you're doing to get the capital gains. So, for example, if you're a trader, you could be claiming data feeds and subscriptions to, to um, different websites. You could be claiming um, other bits and pieces in expenditure. You could be claiming an office space, a computer, all sorts of bits and pieces. So it's really helpful to speak to a good accountant who mm, understands direct definitely. investing and understands what you're trying to do. And this is where a lot of people, um, I had somebody only the other day, you know, they said, oh, you know, I'd like to do my own tax return. And I sort of said, mm. you're in here. Um, mm -hmm. No, you don't do that because if you're doing that, you're not going to get the best results. Mm. You know, you're better off paying for a good accountant. And it might cost you $500 to get it done instead of doing it yourself, but you might get thousands back or minimise your tax. Uh, you know, so there's lots of benefits now, in using a good accountant. Now, how do you know that he wasn't an accountant himself? Because I know exactly what he does for a job. Okay. And, he, and the questions he was asking me definitely weren't coming from an accountant. Okay, fantastic. So, but anyway, but that's, but any more you want to add? Yep, nope, that's enough. All right, so there All you right, go. All right, it looks like we have a text. Oh, fantastic, we've got Jack texting us about zero market on the verge of a long-term correction with recent development. Could you please give me your thoughts on zero? Entered at $84 and the fundamentals look good. Thanks, Jack. Wow. Um, interesting stock. I haven't Good. finished yet. $84. It's pretty close now, to where it is Now, the interesting thing about this one is it was going up when a lot of other stocks were pulling back. Correct. So it actually looks really strong right now. I do like it, actually. I think it's a good-looking stock. I mean, obviously, this is in the technology sector, and this is one that ones that's been pushing the technology mm. sector, obviously, because it's one of the bigger ones. But we can see we've had some, a little bit of indecision through here in um, February. But it's pushed along okay already. We're only two weeks into to March, but it's pushed along nicely. And even this week so far with the last two days, and this bar is just Monday, Tuesday, yeah. it's sort of pushed up, pushed down, and it's sitting right there. So you know, I think if it does all right next week, that was a bit of a surprise, that big bar mm -hmm. last week. But I do like it at the moment. It does look good, doesn't it? Yeah, so I don't have a problem with his buy. I think it's fairly good. I think, you know, looking at his where he might put his stop loss, obviously if we use the little tool what you've got here and, and go down to here so down to that low is 11 percent to me you know i would have my stop loss sitting on that at the moment or mm. underneath that that's pretty much what i'd be doing i don't know what jack's doing but All i right. like it 
Anything Fantastic. else you want to add to it, or is no, you want I'm, me I'm, to keep talking for you? I'm on your you? side on this one. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to go and have a break. Okay, really? You're on my side. How are That's you okay. on my Can side? That's okay. I actually get up and go and have That's a break? That's unusual. You're on my side. That'd be interesting. Oh. All right. Looks like we've got another person okay. texting us. All right. Well, we've got a text from Ramit who says, please advise for capital growth. Should we invest in large caps, medium caps, or small caps? My aim is to invest for 10 years. Good question. Mm. Do you want to answer that? Since I, I answered the last one. 10 years is a long time. It is. Um, is someone, when they're saying they're investing for 10 years, mm. saying that they're going to just leave the money there or they're saying that they would like to be able to just turn things over over a 10-year period? This is the aim to invest for 10 years, so just to keep it simple. Don't okay. try and complicate the process. Well, isn't that in itself meaning long term, though? This is what that I'm not means long -term, quite yeah. sure about clarifying that. Well, it means, to, well, to me, if in the context of what, I'm picking up from the question is because it's content and context. The context, what I think he's saying is, I'm a long term investor, 10 years. That's what I'm looking to do. So, in that context, it's big stocks. Long term trading. All, all of those mm. stocks can get your capital growth, mm. you know, but whether they get your growth, capital growth over 10 years, but in the context of being a long term investor, then big blue Yeah, I guess it, if, if, if you use the word investor, that's one thing. Mm. But if it was someone who was looking to trade long term in the market, it could be a different story. Correct. Depends on well, the, it will be. A it's got to be fit different. for purpose, doesn't it? Well, it is, and that's where we've got to put the context into it. Are you somebody who's an educated trader that likes to trade medium term or short term? Those sort of things. Yeah. But generally, in the context of this show, a lot of our viewers are more Long investors. Long term capital much growth more, and income. More mm. beginners on the market. We do have a lot of traders watching this, but most of them tend to be more beginners. Mm. And I think, um, in the context of that one, I think it's going to be more. Blue chip, big blue chip stocks. Yep. Mm. Okay. Get my book. That'll help you out. Um, if you, that'll tell you how to beat the managed funds by twenty percent. You can still get it. Go to our front homepage of our website, wealthwithin.com.au. Click on the. There's a button on it. You can get it for free. You just got to pay the shipping. That'll help you pick the stocks that'll suit what you're looking to do. It'll help you sort it out. Help you understand how to find those stocks, how to analyze them, and how to make sure you're doing all your position sizing and all that sort of stuff correctly. So in ten years' time you're guaranteed to have a shed load of money, but um, just get that book as it's on the homepage of our website, wealthwithin.com.au. Uh, if you do want to be like our, our last two people and send us an email or send us a text, please do on the screen. You'll find the number there to text us. So, Janine? Well, our next question is from Sonia. Mm. Hi, Dale and Janine. Absolutely love your show, Talking Wealth and the Course, worth every cent. I'm almost finished module three and will head into module four of the diploma in share trading and investment. Just with the knowledge I have gained, it now has me really questioning the buying and selling happening with my superannuation fund. It is obvious there are no rules, no stop losses and no protection on profit once the stock is run. What I have noticed is it appears stocks purchased more recently are sold before older stocks in my portfolio. So the question is, are fund managers exempt from selling on a FIFO first in, first out basis? For example, I have BHP stocks dating back to 2014 that are still active, yet I see ones purchased in 2022 have been sold. Do they sell off the less profitable ones to make themselves look good? Thanks, Sonia. I love the way she's thinking. <laughs> I do too, but um, the answer is no, they don't do that. Because um, you've got first in, first out, you've got so FIFO, first in, first out, yep. and you've got LIFO, last last in, first, first out. out, so you've got that. And highest Probably first. Probably what they're doing, and they'll tell you exactly in the PDS. So if you go and pick up the PDS of the super fund that yeah, you're that's in, great. all the detail, exactly what they're doing in, will be in there because they have to put it in there. What they're probably trying to do is minimise capital gains tax because obviously if you've held BHP for a long period of time, there's probably a lot more capital gain on that than having it in, say, the last six months from BHP shares. They're probably just trying to minimise some of the capital gains tax so that you get slightly better return. Um, but a, why are they selling? That's the thing. That's what well, I wanted true. to know. Well, that's true. Yeah, but she is mm. right. They don't have exit strategies and those sorts of things. So the, the PDS will tell you exactly their investment philosophy. So is it we wait to the top 100 stocks on the All Ordinaries Index or the top And the weightings are affecting that rebalancing and yeah. causing the selling potentially. Mm. Yeah, because they do balancing. They'll tell you when they rebalance the portfolio. For example, I think it was it last week or the week before we had um, the rebalancing of the sectors. Mm. So 
what you'll see is they, they could rebalance their portfolio every time that happens, which is quarterly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quarterly. So they rebalance everything. The ASX or S&P ASX do that, so they'll rebalance the, will reassess the top 20, top 50, top 100, top 200. And when that happens, then the managed funds may need to reassess it. So therefore, they'll sell off stocks and rebalance their portfolio to match the index. But without knowing the actual super fund she's in and having read the PDS, we can't sort of be too detailed, can we? That's right. So, but good question, isn't it? It is a good question. Oh, look, I'm sure mm. that if you actually contact them, they'll probably have an investor centre or someone that you could talk mm. to that'd be good happy question. to explain yeah. it as well. They'd be more than happy to chat to mm. you, isn't it? But you are right. And the more you do our course, the more you'll pick up why you can do much better yourself than leaving your money with a super fund or a managed fund because they are more passive um, and they do have set criteria of what they actually do. And the whole criteria is quite often... You have active and passive fund managers. Now, again, not understanding your super fund, it could be an active super fund or a passive one, but even you know, the passive ones tend to, what they do is you know, all basically set and forget, and then they just rebalance to an index, which is really simple for them to do. And obviously they have um, selling for redemptions out of the super fund, those sorts of things, also paying um, income streams through to people that have already retired, so there might be a reason to sell stocks there as well. So there's lots of reasons why they sell or buy stocks, but um, it does pay to understand the difference between an active and a passive fund, but you can understand why you as an individual will get better returns um, than the managed funds, and uh, you're doing the right thing. You're learning how to do it yourself, so you'll do really, really well. All right, mm -hmm. fantastic. Okay, well, Janine, now it's time to get in for our topic for tonight, which is about how to grab a bargain stock the right way. It's human nature to try and get things cheap, as we all like to get a bargain. However, when it comes to the stocks, uh, the words bargain and cheap do not ever go together. Now, I say this as some people still believe that to make money, you have to buy the lowest price stocks or what they mistakenly believe are the cheapest stocks. Now, if you think that low price, if, oh, sorry, if you think that low price stocks are cheap, keep watching as we are going to explore whether buying the cheapest stocks is wise or just another market myth that makes being profitable hard. We'll also share our stock opportunities below 10 bucks. Now, Dale, this topic mm -hmm. is probably more important than most people watching realize. So should investors be looking for cheap stocks for, or is the whole idea of buying cheap just one big myth? Well, no, people think buying cheap stocks is right. I think they need to come and talk to me and we'll have some few words. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think it is a bit of a myth. You I think. give them a reset, will you? Uh, look, yeah, I'll, do, I'll give them an attitude adjustment on that one. Right, OK. You know, because I think it's... Perception and reality are two different things, mm. you know, and, and we need to understand that the stock market cheap is a different perspective than... Cheap is really a trap. Correct. Mm. Or thinking cheap or thinking buying cheap is a trap in the mm. stock market. And it's not really, really good. So, but anyway, so what is, but also what is a cheap stock? Well, I mean, you explain that in your book, don't you? I do explain that mm. in my book. I do it very well, by the way, too. I think you do too. Cool. One of the things that really hits home for a lot of people once they have made a few mistakes is the realisation about how, if they were just able to avoid doing what most investors do, they would miss making the biggest, most costly mistakes investors make. Now, Dale, you would make some great comments about this in your book, wouldn't you? Yeah, I've got a lot about these myths in the mm. book and all the mistakes that people tend to, or the, can I say mistakes, it's more, at the time they don't think they're making mistakes, but I think they're following what other people do or what mm. they think they should be doing rather than what they should actually be doing. And I mean, a lot of the comments that Buffett put out are contrary to what most people do. And I'm thinking, well, Jeez, you know, if Buffett's He's telling... He's been saying that for a long time. Yeah, I know, but if Buffett's telling you to do something, then why mm. do you think you're better than him? Exactly. You just follow what he says. Mm. You know, don't follow what the dude on, on a chat forum says. Just follow <laughs> Buffett. Like, you know, if you want to make a million dollars, find a millionaire mm. and they'll tell you how to do that. Yeah. You know, that's that was always been my philosophy since I was young. Mm. You know, but people try and reinvent the wheel, Janine. All right, Dale. So should people think about the stock market as they do when they go shopping? Oh, and is this possible to find a bargain in the stock market? Or right now, is it a bit like trying to find a needle in a haystack? <laughs> well, I think people do like treat it like shopping. Like I know if you go shopping 50% off and da-da-da, mm. all those things everywhere. But 
grabbing a bargain at a shop is you know the you actually know the value of what you're buying. Like if you're going to buy a washing but machine. Do you? Well, you generally would. If you were going to go and buy a new washing machine, mm. you generally know. You've got to do a bit it, of research. You've got to do a bit of research across washing machines. Mm. You go, okay, well, I've picked the fish from Pike or Blurt, and mm. I know it's online for Actually, this that's much. an interesting thing. How many people actually do the research on the TV that they buy, for example? I, I know you're talking would. about washing machines, but, uh, you know, a lot, of, washing a lot of guys are watching this now. They're probably thinking, well, if I'm going to buy a new TV, yeah, they're all thinking, yeah, like a new TV. Um, but if they go and buy one, they want to know what type of TV is going to be best for sport or whatever it is. That yeah, but once they've done that research, mm. then everybody goes online to find the best prices. Mm. So they'll go to JB Hi-Fi and say, well, I can get this online for this. Here it is here. Can you match it? Oh, yeah. Yep. And they'll do that. So that's getting the bargain because it's the same product. It's just so who's going to give it to you. So people look at, the, you know, historically what people would do is look at the 52-week history of what's mm -hmm. happened with the price of, of a stock and if it was if it had been trading at a particular price mm -hmm. and they're thinking oh well it's not at that level yet I'll wait until it gets back to its 52 week low and then I'll buy it. then I've, have I got a bargain no no not necessarily. but that's what some people might think it's actually that far from where it's been trading in a year yeah from so the difference between that mm -hmm. And grabbing a bargain at a shop. A bargain at a shop, you can go, okay, well, here's this TV. It's this model. These people said it's this much. These people said it's this much. These people said it's this much. And these people said it's this much. You have a comparison. Yeah, I mean, they, they, so employ, you know which one's they the cheapest employ price. teams of people to assess whether a company's valuation is what it is. That's the difference, isn't it? So if, at, if a stock's at a 52-week low, what's the comparison? Yeah, What exactly. are you comparing it to? And that's what I'm saying is there is no comparison. It's just at a 52-week low. Well, actually, yeah, we could argue about this longer, I think, but... I could argue for an hour. I think we better move on. Okay. Now, I really appreciate the f mar efficient market hypothesis. And the theory says that everything that is known is already factored into prices. So how can an individual ever get an edge in the market if this is true? Is it? Is it always factored in? Is it? Yeah. No. It's not, is it? Mm. So the efficient market hypothesis is there saying everything is known in the stock prices, but it's not always because... That's like in a vacuum. The information in a flow is world. not always perfect, mm. and so there. But but also it does give people, even if it's completely efficient, it still gives people a chance to profit from the market because intrinsically people are emotional, mm. and people don't take what's in front of them and they think, oh, I like Bitcoin. It's going to go to two hundred dollars. Well, that's why prices overshoot. That's why prices why, overshoot. Why they get oversold. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. So it's that human element that goes into it that makes prices go up or down yep, further than exactly. what they should. So if investors search for information on cheap stocks, there are always references to penny dreadfuls, mm -hmm. but somehow the word cheap, penny dreadful and low priced have been confused, I think. So I've always thought of penny stocks as being below a dollar. And yep. Some say it's five dollars. What do you think? Some say it's over 10 cents. Yeah, well. So, but it's, it's, I mean, it's all relative, isn't it? I mean, when, you, mm -hmm. when you're looking at a dollar, you're drawing a line in the sand because mm -hmm. fund managers do. Yeah. So anything under that, you look at the liquidity of it, it's usually terrible. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is what is cheap? Mm. That's the question that most people don't understand is what is cheap? So is a stock at a dollar cheap or is it a stock at $2 cheap or a stock mm. at 50 cents cheap? That's what we're sort of saying anyway. Yeah, true. Now, how about we take a look at a couple of penny stocks and what we call quality companies so that people can see the difference between these and quality stocks. Now, um, what are your thoughts? Well, we can do that, but to me, it still doesn't tell you, it just shows you that they're low price. It's, but I think it, we still need to look at it whether mm. it's cheap, but it's a great idea. There's nothing like seeing the reality for yourself. And, and you know, to me, the data doesn't lie, Janine, it really mm. doesn't. So let's have a look at some charts and then we can get right into it. Yep. Yeah. Now, these are not actually stocks that are below a dollar. So I've just got to say, well, the first yeah, one... But it still doesn't mean they're cheap no. or expensive, does it? No, it's about looking mm. at what. how does somebody tell mm. whether a stock is, you know, has low levels of liquidity. But that doesn't necessarily make it cheap. It doesn't make it cheap, but it's a low price stock. So mm. therefore, what you're saying is it doesn't make it cheap. Now, people who look at 52-week highs might be thinking, if we go back here, now I'm not sure where we are there, 2000, oh, even over the last couple of years, if they're mm. looking at the price now... They're saying it's 
now 57% below where it was trading back at the high. So is that not cheap? That doesn't necessarily make it cheap. No, it doesn't. Because it could be trading at 70 cents in the next six months. Now, this is, a monthly, yeah, this is a monthly chart, okay? Now, yeah. if we go and look at the daily, look at the liquidity. Holy crap. It's just terrible. It's all over the place. So this is how an investor can identify whether it's one of those types of stocks. Mm. This is another one. Yep. So we've just seen this huge fall, but these are the types of declines that you can often see on these low priced shares or low li liquidity liquidity stocks. So 82% fall in a very short space of time and it just dropped out of bed. Prior to that, it was looking fine. Mm. So, you know, that's what you have to be mindful of if you're thinking about trading some of these lower price stocks. Now, now it's heading back towards the dollar mark, but back then it was a $7 but stock. But was it cheap at $7 or expensive at $7? Well, obviously, or fair price? looking at it right now, it, it was expensive because it's trading lower now, way is lower. It, is it cheap or expensive right now? Well, neither, because we don't know whether it stopped falling, and that's the point. Mm. Mm. Okay. So that's the one. And look, just to give people an idea about yeah. bigger stocks. Now, this is South 32, okay? We're yeah. talking about a Much bigger, bigger stock. quality stock. You can still see gaps on the weekly chart on this stock, but and even on the daily chart, of course. But notice how the bars are very different. The way that it moves is different. It's much mm. more um, repeatable. Yeah. So that's the really the point that I wanted to make. So I think... Um, those examples that we were just looking at were really helpful for giving reference points to investors in identifying what to look for mm. because this is just really important for people buying those penny stocks that are often unaware of the risks that they're taking unnecessarily and how they can quickly become the prey and get gobbled up in the stock market. Well, at least their money does anyway. So mm. should investors be looking, what should you be looking for when buying stocks below $10? That's really a good question to answer, isn't it? Yeah, look, I think you know, if you're going below $10, you've got to have the same rules apply whether it's stocks below us, any level. You still have rules around it and say so liquidity is number one. But know. as the price gets higher, generally mm. we're mm. talking about much more liquid shares. Correct. But just because a stock's below $10 doesn't mean it's a liquid. No, it doesn't mean it is liquid or, mm. or illiquid. So it's looking at, there's a whole set of rules about what is liquidity, making mm. sure you've got that first. Um, and then looking at the other rules about, you know, direction, strength, all the other things we talk about as well to make sure you're buying yeah. good veed stocks. You know, it's better to buy a, a great stock at a, a, a low price than mm -hmm. a cheap stock at a bad price. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, if someone, says, quote. if someone says to you, what, yeah. sh what stock should I buy? Mm -hmm. I bet your first react, well, first thought is to tell them, don't ask me. <laughs> but your mm -hmm. second thought might be, well, just buy the biggest shares, and that's the real well, safe it response, is, isn't it? It's just the safest answer. Mm -hmm. It really is, because when people want to, you know, they always ask, you know, give me a hot tip. I go, get educated. Hot <laughs> tip. You know, because if you have yeah. any get me to give you a hot tip, then you probably need to be educated, mm -hmm. not because I can't give them one, but at the end of the day, it's so dangerous for us to do that. Mm -hmm. Because unless you understand how to manage these sorts of stocks, these mm -hmm. cheap stocks, as you said earlier, you're going to have a mm. pretty poor experience. You're going to lose your money. Now, we know investors are mm. more likely to lose when they buy so-called penny stocks. Dale, it's interesting how people with very little or no knowledge get an in initiation into the market starting at the bottom end. How does well, that happen? <laughs> Well, you're just gambling, you know, when people, they, they're gambling when they don't have uh, have their rules. Now, I want to bring up a chart. Can you want to, we want to bring up a chart about risk and reward. And, and what we're showing people on the screen now is this is this is so true what happens here. If the risk is on the left-hand side, you take, when you first start out and you've got no knowledge, your risk is high because people tend to follow the herd and make bad decisions but the more more you understand the more the more knowledge you have the lower risk you take because you then you understand what you should be doing and how you should be managing it but there's also an inverse relationship to the assets that you should be investing in trading in like if you've got no knowledge then you should be looking at the blue chip stocks which is on the left hand side but as your knowledge increases then you can get into things like fx options you know leverage trading but what we find most people do is they flip that chart and they're taking they're trading FX options and using high leverage trading when they've got no knowledge. Whereas the, about a third of the way along that 
knowledge line, mm. people realise, often people realise is they just don't know what they don't know and they don't realise how much risk they were taking mm. when they first started and it's that blissful ignorance mm -hmm. that's so dangerous and there are big people watching this show that are blissfully ignorant mm. of what they don't know. Yep, that's a really um, good chart, I like it. Mm. We'll probably use that for another example too because people make all sorts of mistakes and this is a really good one to highlight. It's just a simple one, I just mm. put that together today thinking I need to show something graphically what they're doing. Yeah, it's awesome. Mm. Now Dal, uh, there are people who do make money trading these stocks and no matter what we say, people are still going to do it. So what is the best advice that you can give them to minimise risk and maximise return? Get an education. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. That's, You're so that's, predictable. That's my first, foremost, and only answer. Get educated. Yeah. Knowledge mm. is the enemy of fear. Mm. It's also, it, it reduces risk. It empowers people. Mm. We need to get into our list of stocks soon as we have a few to cover. So how about we take a look at two to kick things off? Oh, absolutely. I thought you'd never ask. So let's just get <laughs> into the charts. Hey? Okay. All so right. What do we so, want to look at first? So the first one is... This might surprise you, okay? So this mm -hmm. may really surprise you. Um, you can see there, this is Santos. Yep. Now Santos, it's trading, it's a, below $10, but this is a really big stock on our market. Now this is the monthly chart long term of Santos. Now it's got a reputation for being one of the more volatile shares on our market. Yep, but you think this is a good price, right? I think it? that where it's trading at right, I think it may come, it could come back a little bit further. But I'm actually really liking it. I'm liking the mm. fact that it hasn't fallen faster when yep. I expected it could. I like yeah. it. What's the other one? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next one is PLS. Just to give you something a lot different, Pilbara Minerals. Yep. Now this has been really volatile. Now when we see stocks pulling back like this, people might think, oh, this is not an opportunity, but. It's really important to be in the box seat when stocks are falling rather than trying to chase them when they're already running. So I'm really liking this. I'll be looking forward to seeing this this stock take out that low, pull back, and then that would be a nice little consolidation potentially. We could see something mm. bottoming out somewhere between 3 and $3.40, and okay. then we'll just be patiently waiting like that tiger on the sideline. Okay, now I know you've got probably another 10 more stocks to go, mm. Jane, but before we do, we get into more of those stocks. We do need to, uh, or need to share with our viewers, we do need to say goodbye to our YouTube v viewers. So if that is you, you can still watch the whole 75 minute show by heading over to talkingwealth.com and subscribe, as Janine mentioned a little bit before. It's just $3.54 a week, and for that, you can watch this full show and every show we do, and also our Australian stock market update, which we do each and every week, along with a wealth of knowledge from hundreds of interviews from leading experts on a range of topics from investing, retirement, business, success, and the list just goes on. For YouTube video viewers, YouTube viewers, you can still send us in an email for, for us to answer next week. Just email info at wealthwithin.com.au. I reckon I might you know, some people might be having that game where they have a shot every time you get to that part in the script. Move on. <laughs> Go on. Ah, for those watching on TalkingWealth.com, then stay tuned as you will love what we have in the next part of the show as we have more stocks to cover along with a host of other great content. We'll also have lots more questions to answer, so stay where you are as we will be right back after this short break. <laughs> Buying a property is a significant financial decision for anyone that requires careful planning and preparation. With interest rates rising, Gen Zs are feeling even more pressure to get into their first home. So what are the steps you need to take to buy a property? Let's get one thing straight. Living in a house that has your name on the title does not give you financial security. If the goal is to get into the property market and build wealth, then why not do it smarter rather than harder? I always, always suggest you err on the cautious side. Let the market move in the direction, get direction right first. The first things that Janine and I always, always do is get direction right, look at the strength of that direction, and then we look at what we can buy from that point on. And too many people don't do that. And looking at this, you can see this sector hasn't been really, really good because most of the stocks 
are down through in this sort of area here. So it really hasn't been doing that well. We do need to not necessarily take these as buy signals. This is not what this chart does. It's just telling us how fast something is going, how volatile it is, uh, and whether it's slowing or speeding up compared to the market. The charts will tell us where, whether people are buying and selling, and if we understand the charts and how to read all the patterns on that, we can then make better decisions for ourselves.